long story short journal. I established it back in 2009 after a, a few conversations with a writer friend who was saying that he found it nearly impossible uh, to publish long stories here in Ireland. And we had a lot of conversations about what that might do to somebody who, who loves the short story and they can only hit the one note of writing things that are two or 3,000 words. And I felt it was very important for the landscape here to encourage longer writing as well as, as short writing. So uh, that person I was having the conversations with was Jamie O'Connell uh, and Jamie and Madeline Darcy have been a massive help to me this year in being my uh, guest editors. Uh, they've selected the, the two writers that are here today and they, it's been brilliant to introduce a new voice into the, the editorial content that in, informs Long Story Short Journal. So I'm really uh, delighted with the stories that they've brought to us. Um, so a big distant thank you to, to Madeline Darcy and, and Jamie O'Connell for all their help. Um, so today we have two uh, local talents, although Noel O'Regan, I believe, is Kerry originally, but Cork is very fond of him and he's living here now. Uh, and Fiona, you're a native of Cork, yeah, Cork woman. Uh, so local talent. Um, we've got, uh, their two stories uh, really feature a nice convergence of characters and a sense of place working dynamically with each other. I think you'll really enjoy the pairing of the stories as well as the stories individually. Uh, Nola Regan uh, is going to read second. Uh, he's the recipient of a number of prizes, including the Sean Dunn Young Writers Award and the Leonard A. Koval Memorial Prize. His stories have appeared in publications such as Ambit, The Stinging Fly, The Penny Dreadful, a former Kerry County Council writer in residence, he has also work. Uh, he has also had work listed for the Writing.ie Irish Short Story of the Year. First up, we have Fiona White. She's a writer living in Crosshaven, and her short stories have been published in magazines such as Cranogue, The Quarrymen, Hollybow, and now Long Story Short Journal. Uh, she has been shortlisted for the Fish Publishing Short Story Competition and the Stoll Originals Competition as well as the Cork City Library K Award. She won the Tipperary Premier Short Story Competition. And in 2016, she was awarded a Government of Ireland Postgraduate Scholarship to pursue a PhD in creative writing at UCC. Uh, so there's a nice con continuity there from the previous reading. Uh, she's currently writing a historical novel based on the life of St. Cuthbert, which sounds fascinating. So uh, please first welcome Fiona White. I'd like to thank Jennifer and Pat for inviting me here today and to thank the Cork City Library for providing the venue. Uh, the story I'm going to read, I'm actually, it's very long so I can only read about half of it. Um, it's, it's kind of historical fiction in that it's a fictionalised version of events that occurred or possibly didn't occur within my own family. The characters in the story are all real, they're all given their real names with the exception of the little girl and the story is called Entrusted. A week after the funeral, Kathleen went back to the cemetery. A mound of earth was heaped over her mother's grave, sodden lumps of clay weighing heavily on the oak coffin, bearing it downwards to the other coffin, the one her father had lain in since 1952, almost 20 years ago now. Fading wreaths were scattered on top of the earth. Rainwater had caused the ink on the cards to run, and the words trickled into each other, making them impossible to read. She thought she'd like to be buried here too, but it was out of the question. She and Billy had their plot in St. Raymond's bought and paid for. That's where she would be put to rest, St. Raymond's in the Bronx, in a long line of white headstones with foreign earth and foreign flowers on top of her. And the only thing to connect her to home would be the St. Christopher's medal still hanging around her neck. She was staying in her sister's house in Ballyvehan, and after the visit to the cemetery, she returned there to do her packing, but she was restless. She threw her things into the suitcase without any care. Something had caught hold of her at the grave, had reached inside her and awoken in a tremendous urge to go home once more. 
Now nothing would do to set it aright other than to head out at once for Ballinlock before it was too late. Mary Frances accompanied her, muttering all the while that Annie wouldn't appreciate unexpected visitors. Annie greeted them at the door with a tea cloth in her hand. She was surprised, flustered even. Well, I wasn't expecting company, she said, as if this were explanation enough for leaving them standing on their own doorstep. We won't stay long, Annie, I guess, said Kathleen. She inched closer to the door. To be honest, it was so busy the few times I was here, what with the funeral and all and meeting so many people that I didn't get a chance to take everything in and, well, she looked past Annie into the hall. See all the lovely changes you've made to the house. Annie drew her mouth into a smile. She hesitated a moment and took a small step back. Kathleen brushed past, her arms skirting lightly against Annie's as she went by. Mary Frances followed, head bent somewhat, making her seem even tinier than her four foot 11 frame. Danny was sitting at the kitchen table, holding the cork examiner in front of him. At the sight of his two sisters, he closed and refolded it clumsily. Well, well, what cheer. Say good heart, Kathleen. I thought we'd seen the back of you. Isn't it early tomorrow you're off? Mary Frances, what cheer. Sure here as often as myself. Mary Frances laughed and gave a dismissive wave of her hand. But Kathleen stood momentarily frozen as the ghost of her father slipped into the room, his time-worn phrase tripping lightly off Danny's tongue. What cheer. There was a girl at the table too. One of the grandchildren, Kathleen guessed a little girl in a school uniform, writing in a copy book. She didn't look up. This is Ruby, said Annie, Marie's eldest. She visits every Thursday. Ruby, say hello to your grand aunties. Ruby sighed and put the pen down. She looked directly at Kathleen. Ruby, what an unsuitable name for the scrawny child. She was small and thin with a small plain face, a boy's face really, pale skin and some lonesome freckles around her nose. Her hair was mousy brown, long, limp and straggly, with a too long fringe that she kept pushing out of her eyes. The eyes, though, were large and bright, not quite blue and not quite green. They gleamed. Thomas's eyes. Hello, said Ruby. She kept looking at Kathleen and ignored Mary Frances, who patted her on the head by way of greeting. Are you the grand auntie from America? she asked. Well, yes, I live in the States, New York City, but I'm from Cork, just like you. This is home, was home. Are you coming back to live here then? <clears throat> Kathleen smiled. No, too late now, I'm afraid. Ruby, don't be bothering Grand Auntie Kathleen with too many questions, said Annie. Are you finished your homework yet? Nearly, I just have to finish my story for English. She's a great one for writing the compositions and stories, Annie said proudly. The teacher was forever getting her to read them out in front of the class. Sit down, Kathleen. Don't be waiting for an invitation, said Annie. Sure, this is your home. Annie sniffed. Kathleen pulled a chair back from the table. Mary Frances was already settling into hers. Danny set a match to a mound of twisted sheets of newspaper in the fireplace and threw a few lumps of coal on top. I'll boil the kettle for a cup of tea, said Annie. Mind you, I suppose it's coffee you'd prefer, Kathleen. Tea is fine, Annie, just fine. Annie went into the back kitchen. Water from the tap could be heard fizzing furiously into the kettle. Cups and plates clattered onto a tray. The child returned to work. Her handwriting was like herself, small and scrawny, and the page was splattered with tiny blotches. Kathleen wondered that Annie didn't scold her for it. Her father would never have tolerated such sloppiness. She could see him at the table opposite her, nursing a cup of tea and a nagging of whiskey, keeping an eye over Thomas and her as they did their letters. He watched them as they carefully inked words onto pages, rounding their O's as evenly as they could, forming quivering loops on their G's and Y's. He wrote out sentences for them to copy. It's a long way to Tipperary. Keep the home fires burning and his handwriting was a thing of beauty, all elegant curls and flourishes. He made them repeat the exercise again and again. It was a good discipline, he said, and would get them a job in the civil service, though that benefit had eluded him. Sometimes he beat Thomas if his letters were malformed, if their tails straggled, or if a stray dot of ink spoiled a space between words. 
But that was only when he was out of sorts. After a bad night, maybe, when the ghosts of the Germans and Turks had come to pay a visit. It's been good to have you back again, Kathleen, Danny said. Mary Frances nodded. I never thought to see you again, she said, not for the first time that week. You're great for writing letters. I've every one you ever sent me. But sure, it's not the same as seeing someone flesh and bone, is it? It's not, agreed Kathleen. I wish you would get a telephone, Mary Frances. At least then we could talk. Danny and Mary Frances laughed, and Kathleen felt that sense again, that fog that had come over her the minute the airplane had landed in Shannon. She was an alien here in her own home as much as she had been when she stepped off the ship in Ellis Island. She half expected that at any moment someone would come and draw symbols on her arm to indicate her status. C for conjunctivitis, TC for trachoma, X for suspected mental defect. Sure, with the waiting list, I'd be in the grave before it would arrive, said Mary Frances. I wouldn't even know what to do with it. And think of the expense. You're not wrong there, said Danny. And in an emergency, all I need to do is run in town to the exchange and the operator will make the call for me. And she and Danny chuckled again at the absurdity of it. Anyway, Mammy would have appreciated it, you coming all the way, said Danny. I hope so. It sure broke my heart not to come for father's funeral, but everything was different back then. She remembered the morning of the telegram, opening it, seeing first the slight upward slant of the lines, the wide gaps between the words, regret, to, inform, as though spacing them out could prepare her for the news. She could hear Billy whistling in the diner downstairs while she read and reread the telegram. Father passed away peacefully, wanting to believe it, that he had just quietly and gently slipped away to a better place. Funerals were the worst times, Billy said later. His own mother had died the previous year. <coughs> Kathleen shook her head. I had to come this time, she said. I guess I would have always regretted it otherwise. She paused. Did she mention me at all, you know, when she was bad? Danny hesitated. Annie came in, a tray of china cups and plates rattling in her hands. Thomas, she said. It was always Thomas she called for at the end. Danny sighed. Asher, her mind was gone by then. The child stopped writing. Who's Thomas? She asked. There was silence for a moment, and then Annie took charge. Ruby, what did I tell you about asking questions? Finish your homework like a good girl. Then she added, Thomas was Grandad's brother. He went to America with Kathleen. Is our brother, said Mary Frances, and she looked at the others apologetically. God is good. Thomas is our brother. So, the trust don't come anymore, Kathleen asked. She was on her third cup of tea from the good china. Annie said she had inherited it from her mother and it was released from the box under the bed only on special occasions. It had come out for the funeral, of course, and she was just about to rewrap it in newspaper before returning it to its designated home when Kathleen and Mary Frances arrived. Annie supposed they might as well use it because it wasn't every day of the week they had visitors from America. The trust, said Danny, they haven't been for years, not since they let us buy the house. They don't even exist anymore, as far as I know. Who? asked the child. Ruby had finished her homework, but she continued to hold the pen in her hand and roll it between her fingers. There was a blue stain at the corner of her mouth. Kathleen put the china cup back on its saucer with a clang. Have you never heard of the trust? No. Fancy that. I can't get it into my head that so much time has passed. You see, every six months, the men from the trust came to check that we were keeping the house properly, abiding by the rules and growing plenty of fruit and vegetables in the garden. If you didn't keep the rules, the trust could take the house back off you. Remember all the cleaning, Mary Frances. Sure, we used to be days at it, girl, emptying out cupboards, scrubbing every little corner of the house, and father and the boys in the garden, making sure that not a single weed was to be seen on the morning of the inspection. It was one mighty military operation, said Kathleen. Well, those days are long gone, said Danny. But why could the men take the house off you, persisted Ruby. My word, child, said Kathleen. I swear you don't know at all how we got the house. 
Sure, that's all ancient history, said Danny. No one talks about those days anymore. But history, ancient and otherwise, was swimming through Kathleen now. She leaned forward and looked into Ruby's not quite blue, not quite green eyes. My father fought for this house. It was a reward for his service. He was a soldier in the Great War, a quartermaster sergeant, in fact, a hero, you could say. The only thing he ever did right was fighting, he used to say. Really? Who did he fight? Kathleen was beginning to wonder if, for all of Annie's boasting, her grandchild was a bit simple. The Germans, of course, and the Turks. Don't they teach you anything at school? He survived the Somme the, and Gallipoli, you know. She made her last pronouncement to all, as if somehow this were a fact that had been overlooked or forgotten. And then she noticed something. She stood up and walked over to the fireplace. The flames spluttered in the grate and threw out sparks that whizzed angrily past her before fizzing out and falling on the carpet. On the mantelpiece were two photographs, one of Annie and Danny on their wedding day, the other of the entire family, Annie at the centre in an armchair, Danny and the six children arranged neatly around her. The photograph of Kathleen's father, the one of him in his uniform, rifle at his side, was gone. His medals, the Victory, British and 15 Star, which Kathleen's mother had put in their own frame next to the photograph, had also been removed. When she turned around, she made no effort to cover the tears in her voice. They suffered, you know, all those men. Mammy used to say what happened was so terrible they could only talk about it in their dreams. It was the least they could do, the British government, I mean, build houses for the soldiers. It was the least they deserved, homes instead of trenches. I remember the day we moved in here. I thought I'd come to live in a palace. I couldn't imagine living anywhere finer. And still, you left, said Annie. We'll have a drop, said Danny. He was coming through from the back kitchen with a bottle of Hennessy's and four glasses stacked one inside the other. No thanks, Danny, said Kathleen. I almost never drink. But you'd have a drop now, sure, said Danny. Honestly, the tea is fine. Oh, have a drink with us. Who knows when we'll be together again? But please God, we will, said Mary Frances. All of us, please God. We'll drink to that. Danny poured out four large brandies and handed them around. Run into the cupboard under the sink, said Annie to Ruby, and you'll find a bottle of red lemonade left over from the funeral. Dusk was beginning to fall, and the fading light and the flickering fire made the room seem as it had been all those years ago. They toasted their mother first. She lived to a ripe old age, Lord of mercy on her, said Danny. She was hanging on, said Mary Frances, hanging on, always thinking that with the next letter there'd be some news. Isn't it a fright to God all the same, but the same fellow never wrote a single word, not even to his own mother, said Annie. There was the postcard, don't forget, said Danny. Annie snorted. I'm wronging him. Yes, there was the postcard, and in fairness, a single word. Ruby, take that biro out of your mouth. What word was it, Nana? Just his name, pet, answered Annie. Thomas. Danny raised his glass again. We should drink to father too, he said. To father, they said. They drank again, and the brandy slipped down easily. Father missed you, Kathleen, Danny said. You know him. He never said much, but he missed you. But we took good care of him, said Mary Frances. Never you fear. Auntie understood. A clever girl like you, even if you did have a job in the civil service. Sure, the world was your oyster, and weren't you just like him, eager for travel and adventure? He didn't lick it off the stones, that's for certain. He gave me his St. Christopher's medal when we were leaving. He said it kept him safe in the war. Kathleen felt for the medal at her breast, St. Christopher crossing the raging river, his burden, the Christ child on his back. Did the nightmares ever ease, she asked, a foolish question that nobody answered. The nightmares were part of him, the Germans, the Turks, the Tommies, the men of the Leinster Regiment. They called on him at night, tormented him, demanded that he answer for his survival. He screamed out to them in his sleep, begged them to leave him alone, pleaded for peace. It was Kathleen's job to slip downstairs, boil some water for a mug of tea and fill it halfway with whiskey. When she arrived back upstairs, her mother would be sitting up in bed, holding her weeping husband in her arms. Kathleen would place his hands around the mug and help him lift it to his mouth. After a while, the sobs would ease. Sometimes he needed a second cup to return to sleep. 
So Kathleen would wait to see if he settled, watch the tension run out of his body as the Germans or whoever was visiting him retreated to a far corner of the room. Before she left, she taught Mary Frances how to make the whiskey tea just right. But for years, her nightmares were of her father's nightmares, his waking alone without anyone to make the brew to fend off the enemy. America must have been good to you, Kathleen, said Annie. I often thought of going myself. I had a sister and a brother there before me, but I didn't like to leave my poor mother, Lord Rester, and then... You met me, said Danny. They all laughed, even Annie. I've had a good life, thank God, said Kathleen. Billy and I weren't rich, but we weren't poor either. The children all got a college education. But it was hard at the start, real hard. And, well, it's not home. What happened to Thomas? asked Ruby. Thomas, well, he was handsome, said Mary Frances. That head of blonde hair he had. And he was a right charmer, wasn't he, Kathleen? Mary Frances' face was glowing, warmed perhaps by the fire or the brandy or the sheer joy of the opportunity to relive the past. She lived alone and her letters to Kathleen, all cheer and chat, often trailed off on a lonesome note of longing. He was indeed, said Kathleen. And he had the gift of words. No wonder that girl fell for him, Mary Frances said. An heiress. Imagine that, Ruby. He married an heiress. Mammy could never get over it. She used to boast to the neighbours about Thomas marrying the daughter of a millionaire and having a big job in her father's company. Nobody was good enough for the millionaire's daughter except our Thomas. And they had a baby as golden and sunny as himself. That's what you said in your letters, Kathleen, wasn't it? Yes. It was tragic, tragic, sweetheart of Jesus, the several terrible sufferings of this world, said Mary Frances, simultaneously blessing herself and glaring on account of some great injustice. We all have our crosses, said Annie. What was tragic? Ruby leaned forward and tapped her pen on the table. Never you mind, said Annie. Like Grandad said, it's all ancient history now. But Mary Frances could not be contained. To throw a good man out of his own home, the scandal of it, and she called herself a Catholic. Danny refilled their glasses. There's no point in raking over old coals now. It's done with. But whatever happened to Thomas? Ruby pushed her fringe out of her eyes and frowned at Kathleen. Nobody knows, said Annie. He just sort of disappeared. Isn't that right, Kathleen? We lost touch, said Kathleen. If only he'd sent a letter just to let us know where he was. Then Mammy could have written to him as often as she liked. That would have been some consolation at least. Mary Frances was tearful. But she prayed for him every day, always in the prayers of the living, never in the prayers of the dead. He was never one for writing, said Danny, not even when we were small. And it seemed to Kathleen that as dusk settled on the house and the fire grew low, that each brother and sister could see again Thomas seated at the table, wiping the blonde hair back from his face with an inky fist, tears in his eyes, and a red bruise forming on his cheek. All the same, began Annie again. It didn't come easy to him, said Kathleen suddenly. It wasn't natural for him, writing. Well, all I can say then is this one must have gotten her writing from my side of the family. She won first prize at, at essay writing in her school, didn't you, Ruby? Yes, Nana. I mean, said Kathleen, it never came natural to him, no matter how hard he tried. His B's turned out like D's half the time, his P's were like Q's, and he could hardly join his letters at all. It was like a sickness with him, and a shame. Even when he was older, he couldn't put a pen in his hand without trembling. Always he was trying to avoid it. He was never going to write a letter. I never knew it was that bad, said Mary Frances. I mean, we all knew he didn't like doing his lessons, but sure isn't that the way with all boys? Maybe father was a bit hard on him, said Danny. Father tried his best, said Kathleen. She added, sometimes your best isn't good enough. So I leave it there, thanks. If you want to find out what happened to Thomas, you can go to the Long Story Short Journal. <laughs> it's there. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, first off, I'd just like to thank Jen for uh, publishing my story and asking me to read today. Um, it's, I first came to this festival when I was in college here in UCC, and it's about 10 years ago now, um, unfortunately. And um, just 
to be able to participate in the festival this year is really it's a thrill for me. So thank you. Um, I'm going to get you about half the story. So again, like with Fiona, if you want to find out how it ends, please go to a long story short. So, okay. Lamu. Zero to 200 kilometers. The night air here is cooler than Noah expected and scented with something vaguely familiar. Eucalyptus, he thinks, as he sits into the front passenger seat of the rented white Toyota. Ashling turns the key in the ignition and the narrow driveway, border wall, and electronic steel gate are framed in a sudden burst of artificial light. You sure we're good to go? We have everything, he asks. A light switches on behind them, inside the house. One of Ashling's housemates waking up to go to the toilet, maybe, are woken by their movements outside as they loaded their baggage into the boot. A few of the houses along the street have been broken into in recent months, Ashling told them. A UN official who lived two houses up had even been stabbed. Ashling's house was one of the few on the block that had no nighttime security. They couldn't afford it, she'd explained, not on an NGO salary. We have everything, I'm sure, she says, leaning over and kissing him. She presses a button on her keyring after they separate, and the gate opens in hesitant, screeching jolts. As Ashling drives, Noah struggles to match the abandoned streets that now stream past his window with the city he has experienced the past couple of days. Gone is the feeble crawl of traffic, the strangling smell of diesel, the stutter through roundabouts where knuckles harried closed car windows and hands offered roasted corn on a stick, fresh mangoes, pineapple, and one time, a kitten. The route out of the city is surprisingly straightforward. There's no need to turn off or circle back or consult the sat-nav. Near the outskirts of the city, a creature scurries across the road. A dog, Noah guesses, but Ashling shakes her head. Hyenas are a growing problem in the city. There have been reports of slaughtered livestock, pilfered food, a mauled child. Near the beginning of the Mombasa Highway, a jackhammer sounds nearby. The noise particularly unnatural at this hour. Amber lights flash where a crew works on laying a new surface. Ashling speeds up once the highway is reached. I still struggle to believe you're here, you know? She says, her eyes on the road. I know. Me too, to be honest. She hesitates. Are you happy that I got back in touch? I'm here, right? And we certainly wouldn't have done what we did last night if I wasn't happy to see you. Noah shakes his head. Not that I'd expected that to happen. Ashling laughs. What, and I did, is that what you're saying? Noah remembers the words he had repeated like a mantra two days ago, up to the loud whack of a landing at Jomo Kenyatta Airport. Nothing will happen with her. Nothing will happen. Most of the flight had been spent convincing himself he was coming here to experience a new continent, that it had nothing really to do with Ashling, beyond the fact that she invited him and they would travel together for the month. The one thing everyone at home had agreed on when he told them about his decision to travel to Kenya had been that it would be a terrible idea for them to get back together. The world reveals itself in slow and hesitant steps. Fresh mountains sprout up, Wide plains, too, bouldered but with surprising splashes of green. Noah puts his feet on the dashboard, shifts about, trying to get comfortable. The sky wakes featherless blue, plucked clean, and he closes his eyes, only a blink. But when he opens them, the sun is well clear of the horizon. He turns to see Ashling yawn. Want me to take over for a while, he asks, stretching. Awake, are you? No, not yet. We're, we're not too far from this chic temple, I know. We can stop there and use the toilets. I might let you take over then, if that's okay. Yep, whenever suits you. Fifty or so kilometers later, a small town appears. Noah looks at the row of dwellings on either side of the road. He wonders why the word dwellings came to mind, instead of buildings or houses. 
The fragility of the structures might have something to do with it. Tin roofs, sheet iron, or wooden walls. He senses that a strong gust could lift the whole thing away. Near the end of the town, he sees white walls, a golden dome beyond, or behind them that mirrors the morning sun, offering a back smudged and distorted. Ashling drives to the black iron wrought gates and waits as an elderly man opens them. The whiteness of his turban matches the scraggly white of his beard. Ashling performs a little jig in the car park as she waits for Noah to close his door. He follows her along the side of the temple and down a flight of steps to where two open doors gaze wide-eyed out of the wall. He catches that scent again, eucalyptus, definitely, as she rushes through the doorway on the left. Men's is the other one, she shouts back. Looking around, he can, he can understand why people would come to this temple. Not just for prayer, but to rest in a quiet, clean and shaded place, to find sanctuary for a moment before returning to the heated glare of the world. When Noah leaves the bathroom, Ashling is slouched against the wall opposite, bottle of water in hand. She takes a swig and offers it to him. He shakes his head. So you've been here before, he asks. Once, yeah, with, with my ex, the time we drove to Mombasa. She glances up at him. Feels strange talking to you about an ex-boyfriend. Feels strange hearing it, no one mutters, as he follows her back to the car. 200 to 480 kilometers. Noah sits into the driver's seat and takes his driving license from his jeans pocket. A picture of him, a picture of him on the front, solemn and bearded. Noah laughs when she sees it, says he looks like a serial killer. Is that why you came, she asks. Are you here to kill me? Maybe. We'll see how I feel when we get somewhere more secluded, he says as he reverses the car, the gatekeeper already shuffling towards the closed gates. As Noah speeds along the highway, the plains turn flat and arid. The soil reddens. At one point he has to brake to let a gang of monkeys cross the road. Red arse is flashing as they flee. Ashling sleeps huddled in the front passenger seat. He throws careful glimpses at her as he drives. Her strawberry blonde hair is longer, and the high carb Kenyan diet has added a touch of softness. But overall, her appearance has changed little in their time apart. Her complexion has even somehow maintained its near translucent paleness. He wasn't surprised when she told him that, in an office filled mostly with pale Westerners, she was the one the local staff nicknamed Kazuka, Ghost. What changes he has seen in the past couple of days are within her. As he listened to her talk about the maelstrom of her year here, the time she was robbed in a nightclub, someone knifing into the bottom of her handbag without her noticing, the month of power cuts that meant everyone in her house had to wake up at two o'clock in the morning to shower, the time she and her supervisor at work appeared on Kenyan TV, the time she was brought along in a police raid. Or as he listened to her talk of, about her relationship with her mother, still difficult, but the distance has helped. She can't really argue with me through Skype, Ashling said. Through all this, Noah has seen how she has stepped out of herself since their time together. Or perhaps it is better to say that she has stepped more fully into herself. She appears calmer in her kazooka skin, more settled. They had both just been kids last time, really. Still teenagers when they first got together. Maybe this time could be different. He thinks about the printed emails from Ashling folded in his bag in the boot, most near memorized. She wrote in one email, I said, well, you can ask Noah when he gets here. And it really hit me. In two weeks, you are going to be here. I'm going to be sharing Kenya with you. I'm so happy. I really thought you would not at all be up for this. And now that you're open to, to suggestion, I'm going to take over your mind. Three years with no contact, and now less than a month after the first exploratory email, he is in Kenya, of all places, with her. The absurdity of the situation forces a half laugh out of him. The sound wakes her. We there yet, she asks. If only. A truck bellows as Noah overtakes. Tell me about this place where we're going. Tell me about Lamu. She rubs her eyes. Well, I, I only know what I read online and what the crowd at work told me. The island is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's possibly Kenya's oldest town. I've been assured that it's incredibly beautiful and it just seemed like the perfect place to take you. 
I remember how much you love the sea. I've already booked us a Dow trip for tomorrow evening. Noah overtakes another truck. What about those kidnappings in the area? Are you sure you're not the one trying to get me killed? She scoffs. We're too poor to kidnap. Things have calmed down there anyway. The, the travel restrictions were lifted last summer. Besides, we're, we're Irish. Everyone loves the Irish. And what time did you say the last boat leaves for the island? No asks. Just before sunset, she says. We need to be there by then. The speedometer strains close to the 150 kilometer mark on the long, clear sections of road. Even with the windows down and wind blowing in, sweat still dampens his back and forehead, the sun nearing the top of its arc. Ashling bites into a nature valley bar from the hoard of snacks on the back seat, bought yesterday in the Tesco and West, Westgate shopping mall. She feeds pieces of the bar to him as he keeps his eyes on the shimmering road. Noah turns his gaze to his hand. When he squeezes the steering wheel, his knuckles whine. Was it worthwhile? You coming here for the year? A kilometer passes before she responds. I don't know. It hasn't been what I expected. A little part of me coming over here thought I was going to change something, or at least help in some concrete way. Instead, it just feels like I've spent a year in an air-conditioned room doing admin. I mean, how is that helping? Honestly, I'm just happy to be heading back. I, I know Dublin isn't home exactly, but it's a lot closer than Nairobi. When does the job start? No asks. Middle of September. She removes her sunglasses, wipes the lenses with her t-shirt. How about you, Harry, things in Kerry? You said things were getting better at work, right? He nods. Yeah, I'm getting more hours when we go back in September, and they're giving me a leaving cert honors class, too. So you've impressed them, Ashling says. The road veers and sunlight enters the front windscreen, near blinding. Now it slaps down the visor, I suppose. A flurry of villages appear. Noah slows the car. The traffic turned hesitant, fitful. Stopped at a congested junction, he rests his arm on the roll-down window. A Matatu, a unique vehicle, part minibus, part mobile disco, speeds past on the roadside, not bothered by the stall traffic. The pounding electronic bass can be heard for a while after it is turned out of sight. Noah returns his arm to the car's shaded interior when he feels it begin to burn. A signpost reads Mombasa, 17 kilometers. We've made good time so far, Noah says. Don't jinx it, she jokes. She turns her attention to her hands, nestled on her lap. I can only imagine what your friends said when you told them what you were coming here, that you were coming here to see me. Let's say they were surprised, Noah says. I bet, was it all terrible? Honestly, some of it was fairly bad, yeah. But you didn't listen to them. No, I, I did. Look, I know it sounds stupid, but I want to be, I like to think that I am, the type of person who believes in second chances, you know? I, I wouldn't have come here. I wouldn't have let what happened last night happen if I didn't know that I was over all that. Ashling nods. And that's what makes you a better person than me. I don't know about that, he says, blushing. You're the one who just spent a year working for an NGO. Seriously, Noah, I mean, if you'd done to me what I did to you, I, I really don't think I would have traveled halfway around the world to see you. Noah shrugs. Coming here had not been about being the better person. Although he would be lying if he said he hadn't noticed the hint of respect in some of his friends' eyes, those who hadn't called him mad or stupid, when he told them of his plans. He liked to think they were impressed at his courage, maybe, or the level of forgiveness and hope shown. They remembered how he'd been after the breakup, that he was willing to put that aside. Kathy, a work friend, had admitted, that's really big of you, Noah. You're one of the good ones. Plus, she joked, he'll make a great story for the grandchildren if you end up back together. When he looks back at their breakup, Noah finds it difficult to understand why he was so blindsided. It had been coming. In the last few months, they had started to avoid going out drinking together, their friction inevitably unspooled by a mixture of Bulmers, Jaeger bombs, and shots of tequila. It happened the night she came back from a week-long trip to Paris. 
taken as part of her art history course. She cycled to his flat, so at first she took, or he took her flushed expression to be a result of the exercise. He remembers leading her by the hand up to his room, the white tea and linen scented candles she liked already lit. It was only after she'd repeated herself twice and explained why this had to happen that he spat the room into near darkness and brought up the German. The prick, Henrik, who was studying at UCC for the year and was in Ashling's art history class. He'd seen the pictures that she posted on social media during the week, how he'd been in most of them. Big Aryan grin on him. You fucked him, didn't you? The deep sigh out of her, no, no, I'm I didn't. The next Thursday night, the rowing lads dragged Noah out, said it was their duty to see that he drank the blues out of him. He had lost count of the amount of pints and shots he'd downed by the time they reached the brogue. There had been the normal scrum of bodies inside, the surrounding cloud of sweat and flatulence. Another tequila was handed to him by one of the lads, but he spilled most of it trying to get the shot glass to his mouth. The world was spinning to such a degree that it took him a few moments to understand what he was seeing on the dance floor. Then all he felt was the sudden existence of a wounded animal inside him, thrashing about his chest. Her reaction when she saw him, the drop of the jaw, the sudden deep red splashing across her chest and cheeks, cheeks signaled her lie as clearly as the Aryan grin bobbing above her. 486 to 497 kilometers. An amber light flashes on the dashboard beside the speedometer. He switches off the engine. What did the last sign say, he asks. 11 kilometers to Mombasa. So it's taken us two hours to move six kilometers. Fuck me. Not right now, Ashling says. A tired smile is shared. Above Ashling's top lip, a little white mustache has appeared, sweat causing sunscreen to resurface. Clammy hands on the wheel make him doubt his grip. The car in front sighs forward, the car behind beeps until he covers the distance. He turns off the engine before the amber light returns. Lamu, Ashling says, map spread across her lap. Once we get to Lamu, we'll be able to relax. Noah nods. So what was Mombasa like last time you were here? He self-edits the sentence, cutting with your ex. It was fun. We, we stayed in a hostel by the beach. It was one of the few times I wished I wasn't a vegetarian. The fish smelled delicious. So fresh, you know? Sure, you'll see yourself anyway. We'll be stopping here on the way back. I know, but Lamu will be better than Mombasa, right? Noah says. Ashing looks up from the map, smiles. Of course, way better. At the next roundabout, a signpost signals left for Melindi away from the main highway into Mombasa. Traffic flows again on the new road. Thank God, Ashling breathes. It should stay moving now till we get away from the city. Don't jinx it, Noah says, and laughs as she slaps his arm. Noah drives a rented car over a bridge. Below, a wide estuary holds up a shoal of boats, the water a shade of blue that brings the word tropical to mind. Azure. A clear sky above and below. From a certain angle, though, I think it must look like they're flying. Thank you. So we have time for just a quick couple of questions before we move on. Uh, so I'll start off with one of my own and then I'll open it to the audience. Um, so I suppose I was interested when you said that there is an autobiographical element to your story, and I'm not going to ask either of you to confess <laughs> to, to how much of, but it seems like that's um, an area where fiction authors are getting more and more um, confident in crossing over into their own biographies and, and fictionalizing. So I'm wondering what you think is fair game uh, to, to pull from in your in your fiction writing, and, and are there any places that you wouldn't go uh, necessarily? Yeah, I suppose it's um, it's hard to Can you hear her? Yeah. Right up. Um, I suppose it's uh, it's very hard for me to, to figure out where the line is. You don't know that you've crossed it until it's too late and you've crossed it. And then can you actually come back? I don't think you can. Um, 
like I had a lot of problems with that story in that uh, now all the characters are dead except for the little child who just sort of represents me but isn't me but um, I was very concerned that uh, the grandmother figure you know was coming across very one-dimensionally um, you know which, which wasn't fair because that's not really how she was but it, it did represent an aspect of her personality um, but to try and do it in a more uh, fair and um, real way would not have served the story properly. So I just decided to go with it and to just kind of live with the guilt. And I sort of didn't want anyone in my family to read the story, but uh, when my mother read it, and I was really, really nervous about letting her have it, I kind of held off for a very long time, <laughs> for more than a year, uh, to let her read it. And when she finally got her hands on it, she really, really liked it. You know, so. I was happy with that, but I don't really know uh, where the line is. And also because it's a fictionalized event, that scene actually, no, I, no, I thought it did take place, but it didn't. I discovered uh, after I began to write the story that actually Kathleen never came home. So, so but I was just, I just, I just was too involved in it at that point, And I just imagined it as, it, as I think it would have played out with the characters involved. Fantastic, thank you. Hello. Um, I would say it's all fair game, if I'm being honest. Uh, with this story, um, I actually have taken that journey from Nairobi to Lamu. It was something I did. Uh, it's going back a good few years now. So it was basically, I remember checking on Google afterwards, it was 850 kilometers, which we traveled in 16 hours in order to make the ferry to get across to the island in time. And something like that, uh, you know, at the same time then, real life events were quite boring. So you want to draw from that, but, you know, fiction is so much more interesting and you can do so much more. So um, if I wrote about the actual journey itself, it would be very dull. So I was like, well, how can I make this more interesting while using this amazing journey? And so that's when this uh, couple came to me and they're myriad issues, which in the second half of the story, if you look it up, you will, you will see kind of on the spool. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have a question from the audience that you'd like to ask? Okay, I'll ask what, oh, great. Just tell me what you, how you get over the blank page and getting, getting, getting the work done. Well, I, fi I find that very hard. Um, I just, I suppose I just start writing and it, it can be absolute rubbish sometimes and I, I end up just throwing it away. I always start to write with pencil and paper. I won't even use a biro because, you know, just the first draft is so off. <laughs> you know, I don't want to see it glaring back at me. Um, I suppose I avoid it an awful lot, but um, if you can kind of just persist I find I can't really work at home because there's so many excuses. You know, I can do some ironing, I can go to the shop, I can do loads of things, but if I have a desk in UCC, I'm really lucky and it's not on campus and it's much harder to find the distractions there. There's, there isn't even a kind of a comfortable spot, a cafe or anything like that nearby. So I just have to sit down and I might end up with very little at the end of the morning, but I, I kind of had to train myself to say, well, you know, even if I just get 500 words today, you know, that that's okay, I, I live with that. And I just have to ignore all the stories about people who can kind of do 3,000 words in a day. You know, the blank page is really hard. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree on that. Um, perseverance is key. You know, that's that's a thing, just keep going at it. Um, I know Anne Enright had said that you basically have to think it out on the page. And like, as soon as I read that, it made so much sense for me because quite often I would just go in and I'd have this amazing story in my head and I'd almost be terrified to actually put it down on the page in case it wasn't as good as it, it was in my head. Um, but ultimately you have to kind of accept the fear of that and just get it down and it will, well, in my case anyway, it will always be pretty terrible in that first draft, but you keep just plucking away at it and you know, just persevere. 
Just a question about short stories and really how do you know when to stop? Because there's always more, yeah? Like you always feel like you're coming in in the middle of a story and like where do you start? How do you know where to start and how do you know where to stop on a story? It's an interesting word when there's more limits as well. Yeah, sometimes if you're writing for a particular purpose and it has to be 3,000 words, well, you know, you're, you're getting to 3,000 words and you're, you're thinking, well, I have to find a way of wrapping this up soon or going back to the start and cutting out bits or starting somewhere else or whatever. Uh, when you're not writing to a word limit, it's very hard to know when to start or where to stop. Um, for that story, because I wasn't working to a word limit, it, it took me a very, very long time to write. And I thought, oh my God, I think it's, is it supposed to be a novel? Is it supposed to be a radio play? I don't know what the hell it is. And I think if I wasn't writing it, I was writing it for my MA thesis, and if I wasn't doing it for an MA thesis, and it had to be done, I would have just abandoned it because I, did, I didn't know what it was. Um, but I think sometimes you just have to keep writing, and then you figure it out afterwards, and you've done loads of rewrites. Actually, all that bit there doesn't belong. It's not necessary, and then you can just chop loads away, or you know, you realise the start isn't right. I, I, it's actually going to start in the middle, you know. So that's the whole of the first story gone, and maybe I lose that somewhere else. Um, but if you're a bit caught up in it, it's, you might just keep on and on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's funny because Jennifer's already talked about how you know going back and particularly in the Irish scene, uh, word count. Up to recently, it was always two, three thousand for all like the main journals. So you really had to almost condition yourself and think, right, well, I have to get this done in two thousand words or, or whatever. And um, it's only been recently that I've decided to just forget about work and basically just get it out of my head, because ultimately, what matters is character and just focusing on your character and knowing your character as thoroughly as you can. And so, what a short story tends to be is a build up to this turning point for your character. And so whether it takes 500 words to get to that point or 5,000, it's about being true to what that is and what that turning point is and to that character. Um, I'm saying that it's easier said than done to keep that in mind, but I think that is the ideal. I think we're running out of time, so I'm just gonna ask my, my favorite question to ask other people, which is, um, can you recommend a book, something that you've really loved reading recently, or maybe, if not recently, just one of your all-time favorites? It could be a short story collection, or it could be something else. Well, I've been reading mostly historical novels for the past few years. I read Danielle's collection of short stories during the summer, which I love, so I'd recommend that. Um, one historical novel that comes to mind is Hod. I think that's how you pronounce it, but it's a fictionalised version of Robin Hood okay. yeah, by Adam Thorpe. And if you like historical novels, this is a really beautifully written historical novel. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a short story festival, so I think I'll go with a short story collection. Um, a collection I always go back to, and it's such a beautiful book, is um, Alistair MacLeod's Island. So it's basically his collected stories, and he only, I think there are only something like 14 to 16 stories in the whole book, and each one is just beautiful and perfect. And um, yeah, if you haven't read that collection yet, I would urge you to run straight to the bookshop and get it and devour it. <laughs>